Welcome back to this module, the title of which is the Sacramental Seal. What I'd like to do in this module is uh, develop some of the key categories we learned in the first module and uh, apply these to uh, the very important <clears throat> element of sacramental theology with respect to the sacramental seal. Now, if it sounds like I have a head cold, I don't think it's that. I think it's just allergies, but uh, in any case, I'm not contagious through the computer. Uh, but if parts of this module seem a little uh, disjointed, I may have to shut things off to blow my nose. But anyway, uh, let's get started with this module uh, dedicated to a uh, presentation of the sacramental seal. Now, from your reading of uh, Daniel Liu's book, The Bible and Liturgy, you came across that Greek word sphragis, which is uh, Greek for seal. And as you saw in the reading assignment, uh, this comes really from St. Paul. St. Paul twice uh, makes reference to this. Both times, uh, it's really a verbal form. It's not a noun. But we read in 2 Corinthians 1, 22, uh, we hear St. Paul say this, uh, Through the one who gives us security with you in Christ and who anointed us is God. He has also put his seal upon us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a first installment. Now it's a noun here in our English translation. St. Paul uses a verbal form. Actually, he talks about God sealing us. It's a verb in uh, 2 Corinthians, it's not a noun, but we see much the same thing in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, uh, chapter 1, verse 13. When Paul writes, In him you also, who have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and have believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. So we get a verbal sense of that there. Uh, but in both cases, St. Paul is uh, using uh, either in a noun form or verbal form, sphragis, which is a Greek for, that's the noun for a seal. So, it's not that mysterious or hard to explain. Uh, there were Greco-Roman seals. Here you see an example of these. And just as the name uh, suggests, these were seals that were put into wax. They made an imprint into wax. And that's what a sphragis was back then. It was a seal, just as the uh, name suggests. Now, when Paul, St. Paul uses this as a verb, he says, we were sealed, we were uh, marked, is basically what he is saying. When we became Christians, we were marked. Uh, we were branded, almost. We were claimed by Christ, and as proof that we were claimed by Christ, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit. So even in the pages of St. Paul, we see this, uh, the roots of this sacramental seal. St. Paul is saying that uh, the Holy Spirit sealed us, marked us, claimed us as belonging to Jesus Christ. And also in your reading assignment, you know, there were other uh, uses for this, the sphragis, the seal. Uh, soldiers would be tattooed with the initials of their general on their arm again, to show that they were claimed by that general, they belonged to that general. Uh, you know, shepherds would brand their sheep with a, a sphragis. They used that to mark their sheep. And so, again, we see obvious connections here. Christ, the good shepherd, marking us as one of the members of his flock, that through the sphragis, the seal of the Holy Spirit, we are claimed for Christ. So it goes all the way back to St. Paul. Now, St. Clement of Alexandria, shortly after the time of St. Paul, he urges Christians not to use the normal sphragis when they are sealing their letters or signing their property. Most of the Greco-Roman sphragis or seals uh, were mythological figures, you know, the pagan Greek gods and goddesses. St. Clement, however, urges Christians, don't use those for your sphragis, for your seal. Use something like a dove, obvious reference to the Holy Spirit, or use a fish, 
Now, why use a fish? We, we hear, you know, those references to fish uh, in the New Testament, uh, but there was another specific uh, reason why St. Clement's urging Christians to use a fish for their seal. It's because of what the letter fish stands for. Ichthus is the Greek word for fish, and ichthus stands for something. It was an abbreviation for something. Ichthus stands for Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. Now let me show you this actually, uh, how it lines up with the Greek. Ichthus, Jesus, obviously in reference to Jesus, Christos, there's the C-H. So Christos, that the word Christ actually stands for the, the C and the H in Ichthus. Jesus Christus, Theu, Huiu, Son of God. It's actually God in the genitive case. Theos is the T. Huiu is the U. And then S, Soter. So I-C-H-T-H-U-S, Ichthus stands for Jesus Christ the Son of God, Savior. So, again, Clement is saying, use a fish. Everybody will get it. All your fellow Christians will know. They will know that this is a reference uh, to Jesus Christ and that you are a Christian. Or, he says, use uh, as your seal a ship with its sails unfurled. Again, very ancient reference to the, the church as the bark of Peter, the, the ship of of salvation. The church is the ship to which we are all uh, passengers on this voyage over the unsteady seas of life. I mean, pretty obvious connections there. So there are lots of other uh, historical meanings to this Greek word sphragis that uh, you learned all about in your reading assignment. No need for me to repeat those here. But what I'd like to uh, devote this module to is explaining a reference at the end of your reading assignment where it talks about, uh, the author talks about Augustine developing the sacramental seal in his conflict with the Donatists. Now what's going on there? Let me give you a little bit of background to help flesh out your understanding of what's going on with Augustine's struggle with the Donatists. In 313, a bishop's ordained in northern Africa, Bishop Chalius, and again, he's ordained in 313 by an older bishop named Felix. Now, some people had a real problem with Bishop Felix. Why? Well, Bishop Felix was a traitor. Bishop Felix handed over uh, his Christian faith. Bishop Felix caved in to the Emperor Diocletian during the Diocletian persecution, which lasted from 303 to 309, the last great persecution against the church by Diocletian, 303 to 309, before Christianity is legalized by Emperor Constantine, the next uh, emperor. Uh, but during this Diocletian, uh, this persecution of Diocletian, Bishop Felix uh, caves. He turns traitor. Diocletian required that Christians hand over their scriptures as uh, a sign of their uh, repudiation of their faith. To, and Felix did this. He literally handed over the scriptures to some representative of the Roman Empire. Now, those who hand things over in Latin are called traditores. And Felix literally did that. He literally handed the scriptures over. He was a traditore, which you can see from that word, we get the word traitor. So Felix was a traitor. Now, after the persecution ends, he's reconciled to the church, and he was a bishop before, during, and after the persecution by Diocletian. And so Felix ordains this bishop Cicalius in northern Africa. But because Felix had turned traitor, another bishop named Donatus takes exception. He says, wait a minute. That ordination's not valid. Felix, you were a traitor. You handed the scriptures over. We're going to have to have Bishop Cacalius reordained because the ordination's not valid because you, Felix, were a traitor. Uh, this is the, the root of the Donatus or the Donatist controversy started by Bishop Donatus. 
Okay, so Augustine uh, weighs in on all this, and Augustine is Bishop of Hippo in Northern Africa, and so he uh, wants to solve this conflict. Augustine starts thinking, you know, that early church never reordained people. This, uh, you know, request from Bishop Donatus that uh, this uh, Bishop Cancalius be reordained, he goes, the early church never did that. Augustine starts to think there has to be something permanent about the sacrament of orders, just like there's something permanent to the sacrament of baptism. We don't rebaptize someone if they've been validly uh, baptized, even if they're baptized by schismatics, if they do, you know, use all the right procedures, we don't rebaptize them. So Augustine comes up with his category of ex opere operato, simply by the work being done, simply by the sacrament being administered, something permanent happens ex opere op operato, just by it being performed without any kind of uh, requirement of the disposition of the person performing the sacrament. So Augustine says ex opere operato, Bishop Cacalius was validly ordained, and there is no need to reordain him. And so we see the origin of this sacrament, or this category, ex opere operato. Bishop Donatus says that, no, the sacrament happens ex opere operantis, by the disposition of the one doing the sacrament. That's his argument. Since Felix was a traitor, he didn't have the proper disposition, so it can't be a valid sacrament. And so you can see now where we get ex opere operato and ex opere operantis from this controversy with the Donatists. And again, dispositions are important. The whole ex opere operantis is important. It matters. We want proper dispositions as we're entering into the sacraments, but as Augustine uh, noted, it's not required for validity. A valid sacrament is obtained ex opere operato, independent of how good or holy or noble uh, that the person administering the sacrament is. This is another reason why we Catholics accept Protestant baptism, even though they are separated from us, if they use water and say the right formula, it's a valid sacrament, ex opere operato. Okay, so that explains a little bit of uh, the controversy with the Donatists that's mentioned at the end of your reading assignment. The Donatists, uh, they are vanquished theologically by Augustine, but they don't really go away. They're still hanging around for the next couple of centuries until the rise of Islam comes and wipes everything away in Northern Africa that was Christian. So with the rise of Islam, with the coming of Islam, the Donatists uh, fade from history. Or do they? Really, I think as you saw in your uh, class controversies in church history, ancient heresies never die, they're just repurposed. And so the Donatists are still with us. We see examples of uh, Donatists with the American Puritans that founded our country. Remember the Donatists, basically they say they want a church of saints with no sinners allowed. For the Donatists, the church has to be a church of the perfect. The, the Donatists are hardliners. They're rigorists. They are quite conservative, and they just want uh, this hardline church of the perfect few, uh, which has never been the Catholic uh, impulse. We see with our current Pope Francis. Pope Francis is the exact opposite of a Donatist mentality. Pope Francis, who wants the church to be like a field hospital. Again, the field hospital is messy. It's where the wounded come. It's not where the perfectly healthy go. If the church is a field hospital, you know, on the field of battle, a lot of people get really wounded by this world of ours. They get hurt by the world, and they need some place to go to be healed and to be made whole. Just as the wounded on the field of battle go to the field hospital for that healing, Pope Francis wants the church to be a field hospital of mercy that welcomes all who have been wounded, all who have uh, made mistakes, all those who have failed. They need somewhere to go to be healed and made whole. That needs to be the church in Pope Francis' mind. Now for the Donatists, they'll hear nothing of this. The sacraments are only for the perfect, only for all those who already have their act completely together. 
you can see how this mentality, uh, it didn't die out after the age of Augustine. It was with the American Puritans. It was, it's still with us. Uh, Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, who walked out of Vatican II and formed a splinter group in our church, the Society of St. Peter X, I'm sorry, the Society of St. Pius X. There's also a confraternity of St. Peter, but anyway, the Society of St. Pius X, the schismatic group that refuses to accept Vatican II, they have a donatist mentality, in my opinion. They want the church to be for the few and for uh, those that uh, are you know, restricted to their understanding of what the church should be. Uh, it's not just the Society of St. Pius X that has a donatist mentality. Actually, in the state of Kansas, I don't know if you realize this, but there's a guy up in Topeka, Kansas, who claims to be the Pope. His name is Michael, uh, I'm sorry, David Bowden. His name is David Bowden, but he claims to be Pope Michael. He goes by the name Pope Michael. Uh, it's pretty small, this splinter group. I think it's just he and one seminarian and one other priest. But they have founded this splinter group. They think the rest of the church is wrong and that uh, you know they have maintained the true church, the church of the pure, the church of the perfect, uh, with their own pope up in Topeka, Kansas, no less. And it's a sensational story, I guess. I don't know. Someone says they're pope. <laughs> People ask me, what are you? And I say simply, a Catholic. Fifty years ago, I wouldn't have to go any further. We're going to elect a pope, and whoever we elect a pope, if people don't accept him, they're not Catholic. This is July the 16th, 1990, and Habemus Papam, we have a pope. It can't be too much longer before things are starting to turn around, and we can see a little bit of turnaround. Several people have approached us saying, we not only want to join with the church, we believe God is calling us to be priests. In fact, I believe God is calling them to be sort of like new apostles. We're almost starting out at square one. When I first started wearing this, which was just a few days ago, it kind of, the, the realization that hit me is like, well, you know, this is, this is what we're called to do, and time to get down to business. We're fighting the world, the flesh, and the devil. And when the uh, devil turns up the fight, we have to fight even harder. It does not matter if the church would be reduced down to a single person. Truth is not a democracy. Religions all begin as tiny groups. I mean, Christianity itself began as a handful of people. And over time, people, well, I mean, either the movement dies out or more and more people come and it grows or something. The Donatist uh, mentality of the church is just for the restricted few, just for the perfect. Uh, Augustine challenged them. Uh, Augustine got the better of them theologically, although they're wiped out by the uh, Muslims. Uh, they're still with us in a way, in this mentality. Okay, let's recap a little bit what Augustine achieved in his controversy with the Donatists. First of all, he clearly articulates that the validity of a sacrament is not dependent upon the holiness of the minister, and thank God for that. So the personal disposition of the minister is not required to be perfect and pure for the administration of a valid sacrament. So even though that Pope Felix was a traitor who was later reconciled, uh, his uh, lack of courage did not prevent a valid sacrament from occurring when he ordained bishops after him. So Augustine clearly articulates for us that the holiness of the minister is not required for validity, but also Augustine clearly articulates something permanent in the reception of a sacrament, the seal. This is the permanent component of every, uh, well, uh, uh, let's say the sacrament of baptism and holy orders in particular. There's something permanent that's given by baptism and, in this case, holy orders. Augustine develops 
What St. Paul noted in those two letters, 2 Corinthians and letter to the Ephesians that I mentioned earlier, St. Augustine develops this understanding of St. Paul about being sealed with the Holy Spirit. Augustine says in some sacraments, this permanent seal is given. It is communicated. The seal is something permanent and can never be lost. So Augustine is going to articulate two basic fundamental elements to the sacraments. There's the sacrament of the seal, the permanent effect, and then there, is the, there are the non-permanent effects, the graces that can be lost when we sin. So this Bishop Felix, he lost his courage. He lost the graces of the sacrament. Uh, there are effects of the sacrament that can be lost through sin, but there's also the permanent seal that is not lost, even in spite of sin. And so uh, this is how Augustine basically overcomes the arguments of the Donatists that no matter what the uh, personal disposition of the minister, something permanent is given, the sacramental seal, again, based on his reading of St. Paul, as well as the fruits of the sacrament that can be lost uh, in the case of serious sin. That wins the day uh, back uh, in the 4th century, early 5th, when Augustine is fighting the Donatists, and basically it holds true uh, for several centuries, but there's a later challenge that occurs and it requires further development by later theologians. Uh, a later challenge by a guy named Berengar of Tours. Berengar of Tours uh, lives in the 11th century, so long after Augustine, who was active in the 4th and early 5th. The 11th century, Berengar uh, is at work uh, as a theologian in the Cathedral of Tours in France. And Berengar uh, kind of falls into a trap that, uh, to use the categories from the previous module, Berengar looks at sacraments as either signs or realities. Now remember in the previous module, a sign has a one-to-one -one meaning. A sign means something else. It has a one-to-one -one meaning. So Berengar looks at the Eucharist, and he says, you know what, okay, we've got this definition of sign. A sign points to another reality. So he says, uh, either the Eucharist is a sign, or it is a reality. What he means is a sign points to something else. So the, either the Eucharist points to something else, or it is that something else. Berengar is trapped in this either-or framework, either the Eucharist uh, is a sign, and if it's a sign, then it's pointing to something else, or it's a reality that it is that something else to which a sign, every sign, points. And so Berengar starts to question the uh, reality of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. He says, you know, the Eucharist, it doesn't look like the body of Christ. Uh, so it, if it's, it's either a sign or a reality, well, he says, well, he concludes it must be just a sign. Remember, a sign points to something else, and so Berengar says we've got two options here. Either the Eucharist is that something else, or it's just a sign, and he concludes, given what he can see with his own eyes, it's just a sign. It's just uh, a representation. It's not the reality, it's just a sign. And so kind of in, he's kind of thinking like some people do today, the Eucharist is just a symbol uh, in that very, uh, you know, impoverished understanding of symbol. Berengar is basically thinking, well, the Eucharist, it's either or. Either it is a sign that points to something else, or it is that something else. He concludes it's just a sign. So, this is the challenge of Berengar and Tours. Theologians start to get to work. They uh, have to uh, further refine their understanding of the sacraments. And uh, this is how the breakthrough occurs. Uh, they develop a, a very essential third category in sacramental theology. Let me show you what these three categories are. The three categories that the medievals develop in response to Berengar tours, here are the three in Latin. There's sacramentum tantum, there's res tantum, and then there's sacramentum et res. Let me break these apart for you. Sacramentum tantum. Don't think of that as just sacrament. Don't, don't uh, 
uh, fall into a, a false understanding of that word. Sacramentum just means sign. So, sacramentum tantum just looks at the signs of the sacrament. It just looks at the appearances of the sacraments. It just looks at, uh, it just studies the sign value of the sacrament. And so sacramentum tantum just looks at that component of the sacrament. And the medievals develop a very important category under sacramentum tantum, which is accidents. And so the, an accident, to use uh, this medieval vocabulary, refers to the color, the shape, the size of things. These are uh, considerations of the signs of the sacrament. So the accidents, of the Eucharist would be bread and wine. Uh, before consecration, we can look at, we can call them, refer to them as the bread and wine, and we can describe the, brown, uh, the bread, the color of the bread, the shape of the bread. We can uh, study all the accidents of the Eucharist under the category sacramentum tantum, sign only. Now, res tantum just looks at the reality of the sacraments, doesn't consider their signs, doesn't consider uh, what's used in the sacraments. It just talks about the reality of the sacraments, which would be uh, the effects of grace. It would be the fruits of the sacrament. Uh, in the Eucharist, it's the body of the risen Lord, the real presence of uh, the sacrament. So the res tantum is the essence of the sacrament. It's the reality of the sacrament that's considered apart from what the Eucharist looks like, the color, shape, texture, size of the bread, all of that. Here's a, 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 a distinction I think that might help you here. The res tantum is the reality. The res means reality or the essence of something. And the accidents are just the appearance of something. So, uh, you know, what do you look like? What's your hair color? What uh, you know? What are your all the appearances? Your physical appearance? Those are all considered parts of your accidents. I know it doesn't sound very flattering, but that's the way the medievals talked. Now, if you get sunburnt, who you are as a person doesn't change. The essence of you, what makes you you, your personality, your soul, all of that, your sense of humor, uh, just who you are. As a person doesn't change if you go out in the sun and you get sunburnt. You used to be lily white, now you're lobster red. Your appearance has changed, but your reality has not. Your accidents have changed. The color of your skin has changed, but your reality has not. This leads to a breakthrough in the Middle Ages that helps overcome the objection of Berengar of Tours. This third category is sacramentum et res, the sign and the reality considered together. So, with respect to the Eucharist, this understanding of sacramentum et res, it leads to our theology of transubstantiation, that there can be a change of substance without a change of accidents. That's what transubstantiation means. Transubstantia, a change of substance, but it's not a change of accident. So, what before had the essence of bread, had the essence of wine, changes during the prayer of consecration. It's no longer the essence of bread. It's no longer the essence of wine. After the consecration, it's the essence of the risen body, the glorified Lord, after his resurrection. The real presence of Christ. That is the reality of the Eucharist. And so, it's a pet peeve of mine. I ho I'll hear people refer to the bread and the wine uh, afterwards, like, I'm going to be a minister of the bread, I'm a minister of the wine. You're not. You are a minister of the body of Christ or a minister of the blood of Christ. There's been a change of substance. It's no longer bread and wine after the consecration. It's now, the essence has changed, the substance has changed. It's now the essence, the res, of the risen Christ. Now the accidents are still there. It still looks like bread. It still looks like wine. The accidents haven't changed. If you put uh, the precious blood under a microscope, it'll still look like wine. There's still an alcohol, uh, a component of alcohol to it. All the accidents are still there. The accidents don't change. The substance changes. Transubstantiation, a change of essence. 
It was this third category, how to have a change of substance without a change of accidents, res et sacramentum. It was this change that overcame the objections of Berengar of Tours, who just had those two categories. He just had the accidents, the, the sign, or he had the reality. He didn't see how you could have a change of reality without a change in sign. Sacramentum et res was the breakthrough that allowed for Berengar of Tours to be refuted. Okay, I'd, I'd like to do just a short excursus here, since we're talking about Berengar of Tours and the real presence of Christ. I'd like to take you to a place that if you go on the Rome trip, you'll see with your very own eyes. I want to take you to Orvieto in Italy. Orvieto is just not even two hours north of Rome. A cathedral was built at Orvieto uh, to commemorate a Eucharistic miracle that happened very close by in Bolsena. Bolsena is the place where the miracle happened, but they built the cathedral in Orvieto to commemorate the miracle. Now, what happened in Bolsena? Well, a priest from Germany is making his way down to Rome uh, back in the 13th century. Good man, good priest. We can assume that uh, because he's a priest, I guess. It might be a stretch, but still. Uh, he has a problem, though. He's starting to doubt the Eucharist. He's been thinking about Berengar of Tours maybe too much. I don't know. He starts to doubt the Eucharist. He stops to celebrate Mass in Boltsena, and during the consecration, the host begins to bleed. And so this Eucharistic miracle occurs. He is uh, shaken out of his disbelief and has a belief in the real presence of Christ given this Eucharistic miracle in Bolsena. What they do then is they take the host from this place and they take it to Orvieto and they build this magnificent cathedral there with this spectacular chapel. It's just called the Chapel of the Miracle. And here's a picture of the interior of the Chapel of the Miracle. And I want to take you closer. Uh, well, on the sides of the walls of the, chapel, of the chapel, you can't see it now, but if you go to Orvieto, you'll see it for yourself. It tells the story of this Eucharistic miracle. But up in the monstrance, in this close-up, you can see uh, 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 the host of uh, what, uh, the, the host that was the subject of this Eucharistic miracle in Bolsena. So up in this monstrance, in this chapel of the miracle, is the host uh, from this uh, Eucharistic miracle at nearby Bolsena. Okay, this happens in 1263. In 1264, very next year, Pope Urban VIII uh, commemorates this Eucharistic miracle by inaugurating the Feast of Corpus Christi, the Feast of the Body of Christ. In 1264, he fixes this date in the liturgical calendar. So this Eucharistic miracle in Bolsena that's commemorated in Orvieto, it's now in the universal calendar, calendar of, the, of the church in the liturgical year. It's been impacted, uh, shaped, enriched by this Eucharistic miracle in the Feast of Corpus Christi that celebrates it. 1264, Pope Urban VIII asked St. Thomas Aquinas to come up with a hymn to celebrate this newly created feast day, Corpus Christi, and Thomas Aquinas gives us that magnificent Eucharistic hymn, Tanto Ergo Sacramentum, that every Catholic knows. Uh, it's, it's a magnificent, beautiful hymn that we sing that benediction to this day comes from St. Thomas Aquinas at the behest of Pope Urban VIII, 1264, in reaction to this Eucharistic miracle to commemorate it, and we uh, have this richness to our liturgical year because of that. Okay, we'll see this for ourselves if, if you go on the uh, trip to Rome, but let me uh, circle back now and just try to round this module off by showing how this medieval breakthrough of Sacramentum et Res how it impacted the sacramental seal of Augustine. Now notice what we have in Sacramentum et Res. It's, it's not just the sign, it's not just the reality, it's the, it's the sign and the reality together. This is what happens in the sacraments. There's uh, the sign and the reality uh, uh, are interchangeable with each other and impact each other. But what happens after we have this breakthrough in the Middle Ages is they look back at Augustine's theology of the sacramental seal and they say, you know what, it's still kind of static. 
in Augustine. It's kind of passive in Augustine. Augustine is, yeah, he's read St. Paul. He sees and understands the fragis as this sealed, you know, where it makes a mark in wax. But that mark seems kind of static. It's just something passive. Something is, you know, more marked. But that mark is just on the surface of the soul as something passive or static. Sacramentum et res, the reality now, changes and enriches and deepens this understanding of the sacramental seal that we get from Augustine. So now, uh, the seal is not just this spiritual tattoo on your soul. It's not just this mark on the surface of your soul. Now there's a, a change in you. The sacramental seal is not something passive in you. It's a lived reality. It's a dynamic reality in you. Having received the sacrament, you're not just receiving this passive mark on your soul like a tattoo. Instead, your soul is changed by the seal, by this dynamic reality, by this, this sacramental res that is now um, you know, imparted onto the very surface of your soul. It's, it's like the surface of your soul has been raised. The surface of it's been changed. You've now got additional spiritual receptors on the surface of your soul, to use very imperfect language, I know. But the point is, going through sacraments changes you. It just doesn't just put a passive mark on your soul. It actually changes the contours of your soul. That's what uh, this enriched understanding of the sacramental seal uh, that the church has as a result of this uh, medieval breakthrough of sacramentum at rest. Now the sacramental seal is not just a, a mark on you, it's a dynamic lived reality. Uh, your soul changes, basically. You change by going through sacraments. What kind of change? Your soul changes, the very surface of your soul changes by going through sacraments. Of course, it's not just the soul that changes. Sacraments change the whole person. Here's how Father Cesario puts it. Baptism makes us justified. Confirmation makes us witnesses. The Eucharist makes us lovers. Marriage makes a man and woman husband and wife. Holy orders makes a man a priest. Penance makes a sinner effectively penitent. Holy anointing makes a dying person ready to see God. In contrast, Father Cesario noted that uh, in looking over several church bulletins in the Washington, D.C. area, he saw a couple of other descriptions about sacraments, descriptions that we want to avoid. One of them went like this, sacraments are not just ritual acts that give grace, but opportunities for people already in God's grace to celebrate that fact through symbolic activity. He found another bulletin. Uh, this was for an RCIA uh, handout. It said, In sacraments, we gather to celebrate our belief in God and God's care through liturgical ritual, and to live out or affirm Jesus' values, and to encounter Jesus, and through Him, God. Now, these definitions, as you can uh, readily see, are not entirely wrong, but they are uh, problematic because of what they leave out. They are woefully inadequate. The constant teaching of the Catholic Church is simply this. Catholic sacraments change us. Sacraments change us. So let's avoid such fuzzy thinking in this class. Sacraments change us. And we'll consider uh, how they change us in more detail as we go throughout this course and especially later in Module 15. Uh, right before we get to the section of the RCIA. You see, Catholics and Protestants do look at things differently. I'm not going to say one's better than the other right here, but I'm going to say Catholics and Protestants do look at things differently. They see things a little differently. Now, they're complementary. I'm not going to put it black and white, like, you know, good and evil. I, we want to get out of that kind of stereotypical thinking. But something happens to you, something happens to Catholics as a result of experiencing sacraments. This is important for you in your work in the RCIA. It's important for you to understand those coming to you in the RCIA, that Catholics see things, they're changed, they're somehow different because of the reception of sacraments. The difference is the seal in you is not just a passive mark. It's a change in your soul. It's a change on the surface of your soul. This is a, a lived reality in you 
that's enriched and enhanced and strengthened and enlivened by the reception of sacraments. The sacramental seal is not a passive mark. It's a lived dynamic reality in you because of the reception of sacraments. Again, I'm going to develop that much more in a later module. If it's raised tantalizing questions, good. I'm glad. I hope it did. I hope you're wondering, when is he going to get to explaining what he just meant there? I will later, I promise, in Module 15. We'll do this in much more detail. Okay, thank you for your attention on this module. That will wrap things up here. Reading assignment, of course, is listed on your syllabus and threaded discussion in your study groups. Until next time, thank you again. Uh, goodbye and God bless.